Dark Cast Network, Indie Pods with a Dark Side. Hello and welcome back to Fuck That. It is still June, therefore I am covering another case for Pride Month, but this week I have a special episode for everybody. I am collaborating with CJ, who is the founder of Darkcast Network, which if you couldn't tell by the soundbite at the beginning of every single one of my episodes, it is the podcast network that I'm a part of. So we are going to be collaborating on a central topic, and that topic is the gay panic defense. CJ is the host of Beyond the Rainbow podcast, which focuses on crimes committed by and against the LGBTQ plus community. So you're going to be hearing about two different instances of the gay panic defense being used. And the case that I'm going to cover is the first time that the gay panic defense was used in the United States. But before I delve into that, I want to give a little bit of a background on the gay panic defense. This is a legal strategy that refers to a situation in which a heterosexual individual that is charged with a violent crime against an individual in the LGBTQ plus community, and this is typically murder, claims that they committed the crime because they simply lost control. Now, this defense is centered around an alleged unwanted sexual advance that caused the individual to react violently and is then used in the hopes of getting an acquittal, a mitigated sentence, or a conviction of a lesser offense. The case that I'm covering today, which is the first instance that it was used, again, the perpetrator was ultimately convicted of a lesser offense. Today, I'm going to be talking about the murder of Scott Amador following his appearance on the Jenny Jones show, revealing his secret crush to one of his close friends. It was 1995, and the stage was set for a fateful appearance on the Jenny Jones show, which was a popular daytime talk show known for its controversial topics and salacious approach to shocking daytime television. Scott Amador, a 32-year-old resident of Lake Orion, Michigan, contacted the show to participate as a guest, but What Scott didn't know was that his decision would have dire consequences. Scott Bernard Amador was born on January 26, 1963 in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, but he grew up with his brothers in Lake Orion, Michigan. Scott served in the Army, and during his time in the Army, he came out as gay. According to Scott's brother Frank, his family was accepting, including their father. Scott was stationed in Germany and took up skiing and became a very avid skier. When he later arrived back in the United States, he was honorably discharged. Scott then began bartending in Lake Orion, and he was described by family and friends as a kind and loving person. Scott was also known to be very handy. In fact, he was so handy that he was referred to as a homemade electrician. One of Scott's favorite shows was The Jenny Jones Show, and he watched it religiously. At this point in time, Scott was harboring a secret crush on his friend Jonathan. Scott, who was a fan of The Jenny Jones Show and often saw their segment of Secret Crush, saw this as an opportunity to express his feelings on the Secret Crush segment of the show. And after reaching out to producers, he was invited to reveal his secret on a special segment called secret same-sex crush. Scott genuinely had feelings for Jonathan, so he thought that this segment would be a good way to perhaps get something started between he and his good friend Jonathan. Quick side note, this is not relevant at all, but it's important to me. So I cited this in the show notes, but I watched Trial by Media, the episode on this case on Netflix. And at the end, when the credits are rolling, there's a slideshow of photos of Scott. It's really touching. But one of them is a photo of Scott asleep on a couch with what I'm assuming is his dog. I'm going to assume it's his dog. But either way, it doesn't matter. It's adorable. And the dog on the couch is a boxer. 
And if you follow me on social media, you know that my mascot is my dog and it's a boxer. So I just automatically adore any person that has a boxer. Therefore, I automatically adored Scott. Now, the man that Scott had a crush on was named Jonathan Schmitz. And Jonathan was a 24-year-old man who worked at a local restaurant in Orion called Fox and Hounds. Jonathan and Scott met through a mutual friend named Donna Riley. Donna lived in the same apartment complex as Jonathan, as well as one of Scott's brothers. So one day, while Scott was visiting his brother, he happened to meet Jonathan, who was working on fixing the brake lines of Donna's car in the parking lot. Circling back to Scott's favorite show, which was the Jenny Jones show, initially when Jenny Jones started this show, she had aspirations of portraying herself as someone similar to Oprah, and that is how her show was formatted when it began. She really wanted to mirror that talk show experience, but one that was productive and not similar to other talk shows of that time, like the Ricky Lake show, Sally Jesse, Maury, Jerry Springer. So she wanted to be more of a helpful and positive talk show. When the Jenny Jones show was launched in September of 1991, it was actually the biggest launch in syndicated talk show history, and it debuted over 178 television stations across the United States. Again, the show was formatted as a traditional talk show, and this was during the first two years it was on air. But by 1993, ratings were consistently low. So this prompted the show to shift towards a more Jerry Springer type format. The Jenny Jones show began to incorporate themes that included paternity tests, strippers, secret crushes, neighbor feuds, and bad teenagers. I swear to God, I wish that the bad teenager segment never existed because if it wasn't for that, we would never have to deal with bad baby. But I digress. One of the positives about the shift in format of the Jenny Jones show is that it began to include live performances, and there were actually several big names that made their first national television appearance on the Jenny Jones show. And some of those artists include Ludacris, 3-6 Mafia, and Usher. However, all of that aside, the Jenny Jones show took on the approach of ambush television, and this is something that's very problematic still to this day. Ambush television was something that was widely used across the board at the time on popular talk shows. We've all seen it, Maury, Sally, Jesse, Raphael, Jerry Springer, You're Not the Father. We've all seen that salacious television. And now Jenny Jones wanted to incorporate this style because that's where the ratings were at at the time. If you're a millennial, you are very familiar with what ambush television is, especially on those sick days or the days that you played hooky, staying home from school. You see all of those cheating episodes, paternity tests, what have you. Basically, ambush television is any kind of episode that keeps information from participants, and this is done in an effort to deliberately trick and embarrass them in the hopes that it would cause a confrontation in front of a live audience. Ambush television manipulates participants in order to spark a very emotionally charged reaction. So this case takes place in 1995, and the show shifted to that ambush television format in 1993. So by 1995, the producers were well-versed in getting ratings high following an ambush-style format. So at this point, the producers were known for pushing boundaries to create dynamic television, and when Scott applied for the Secret Crush segment, They saw this as an opportunity for a truly sensational episode. They orchestrated the revelation, keeping it a surprise from Jonathan until the moment it unfolded on stage. In fact, when Jonathan was contacted by the producers after Scott had submitted his application to be on the show, they informed him that there was somebody who had a crush on him. Now, this is where it varies. Producers state that they said that it could be a man or a woman, and this is Warner Brothers distributed the show, and producers and Warner Brothers have taken a united stance and said, nope, we said it could be a woman, could be a man. However, Jonathan and his defense firmly states that they said that it was a woman. But either way, 
Jonathan was told that he needed to come onto the show to determine who his secret crush was. My opinion doesn't really matter, to be quite frank, but I'm inclined to believe that the producers did not tell him it could be a man or a woman, and I will elaborate why in just a second. On Monday, March 6th, 1995, the episode titled Same Sex Secret Crushes was recorded in front of a live studio audience in Chicago, Illinois. Scott nervously took the stage, knowing that he was about to reveal his secret crush on one of his really good friends. But little did Scott know that this moment would lead to a chain of events that would end in tragedy. The episode would never air. However, you can find it online. Jenny Jones introduced the segment with the following question to the studio audience. I've watched the episode in its entirety, so these quotes I've pulled directly from the episode and anything that I have in terms of commentary to try to describe the dynamic of the episode is coming from me directly watching it. So this is how she introduces the segment, quote, Now which of these ways would you choose to reveal your secret crush on somebody? Would you write that person a letter? Would you tell that person in private in case he rejects you? Or would you tell that person you're gay and hope he is, too, on national television? Again, just to reiterate, Jonathan did not know who would be revealed as his secret admirer. During the segment, while Jonathan was tucked away backstage with headphones on so he couldn't hear the conversation on stage, Scott was encouraged by Jenny Jones to discuss his fantasies about Jonathan. Scott sat on stage with their mutual friend, Donna. During the recording, Jenny Jones was 100% earning her pay. And then some. Jenny was asking Scott pointedly, probing, and very sexually explicit questions about Jonathan. And in my opinion, it was evident watching it that Scott, even though he was super outgoing, which was evident when he came on stage, and again, he was the one that wanted to be on the show, but in spite of all of that, It was evident that after a lot of her questions, Scott was uncomfortable. He does chuckle, and even though he hesitates, he does answer the questions, but it seemed to me that even in spite of his very outgoing and bubbly personality, Scott even felt very put off by the questions that Jenny Jones was asking. To me, it seemed like these questions were asked specifically to catch the guests off guard, Not just Jonathan, but Scott as well. And it seemed like she was trying to invoke an emotional response and stir up the audience. And the audience was riled the fuck up. And again, this is 1995. So it was just a whole different vibe back then. Society as a whole was just way more taboo. You just didn't talk about sexual stuff as openly. So... This was definitely considered to be salacious and just, oof, risque television. And this is regardless of sexual orientation, right? You just didn't talk about sex as openly as you do today. So immediately after her line of questioning, Jonathan was prompted to walk onto the stage. And he walked up to Donna first because she was the first person sitting in the path that he was walking. And he gave her a big hug. He then walked over to Scott, and this isn't just my opinion, although I did note it. It's also noted in trial documents. It's a little uncomfortable. Scott goes to give Jonathan a hug, and Jonathan kind of offers him a handshake with his right hand. And as Scott and him almost kind of hug, Jonathan kind of gives him his right shoulder and shakes his hand. It's a little bit awkward, but I don't think that there's anything behind it because it's evident that Jonathan had no idea what was going on up until this point. So as soon as Jonathan sat down, Jenny Jones began her attack. And she says immediately, quote, did you think Donna has a crush on you? And Jonathan says, did I? No, we're good friends. And then Jenny Jones says, well, guess what? It's Scott that has a crush on you. And Jonathan replies with laughter and says, you lied to me. Now, that is why I'm inclined to believe that producers said that it was a woman, which if you think about it, if they're really trying to have this ambush television shock factor approach, 
it would make sense following that logic that they would imply that it was a woman and not it could be a woman, it could be a man. And then it would cause more of a surprise for Jonathan when he came onto the show. Now, that's not concrete evidence. That's just my two cents, and my two cents doesn't really fucking matter, to be honest. But it does make sense that that was his response based on him saying, hey, producers told me it was a woman. Because otherwise, I'm not sure what the lie was. So the revelation of Scott's affection for Jonathan definitely left him visibly stunned. The studio audience was eating it up. They erupted in applause, cheers, and laughter. And everybody was unaware of the storm that was about to engulf the lives of everybody that was involved. But in response to the news, Jonathan kind of laughed uncomfortably and said that he was, quote, definitely heterosexual, end quote. Again, throughout the episode, Jonathan seemed to laugh the revelation off. And the trio actually ended up flying back home to Michigan together, Jonathan, Scott, and Donna. When they arrived back home the following evening, they found an old, broken, flashing construction light in the airport parking lot. And Scott ended up picking this up, teasing Jonathan because he had a broken blinker in his car. The trio then went drinking at Brewski's Bar, which is a local bar, together. And then they all went back to Donna's apartment later that night. Following the taping of the show, Jonathan did tell several friends and acquaintances that he was humiliated and embarrassed by the experience. And beginning with that night that they went to drink at Brewski's, Jonathan ended up going on a drinking binge. On Thursday, March 9th, 1995, just three days after the show's recording, Scott left a note on Jonathan's door along with that same flashing construction light. The note read, quote, If you want to turn it off, you'll have to ask me. P.S. It takes a special tool. End quote. Jonathan, who spent the previous night at a female friend's house, returned to his apartment shortly after 10 a.m. that day. As he approached his apartment door, he saw the note, he read it, and it was this that caused the pivot to him deciding he wanted to murder Scott. According to their mutual friend Donna, this note was intended by Scott to be a joke, and he wanted it to make Jonathan laugh, but obviously, Jonathan did not take it as such. morning, Jonathan, who was overwhelmed by a mix of humiliation and anger, went to his bank and withdrew $300 from his savings account. He purchased ammunition, and then he purchased a 12-gauge pump-action shotgun. Jonathan decided he was going to go to Scott's mobile home, and he was determined to confront him about the revelations made on the show. So once he purchased the shotgun, Jonathan drove to Scott's trailer in Orion to confront him about the note that he left. But according to court documents, Scott simply smiled at Jonathan. Jonathan then was even more enraged by this and told Scott he needed to turn his car off. So Jonathan walked to his car and grabbed the shotgun. Scott's roommate Gary Brady, who was home at the time, testified that as Jonathan walked back to the trailer door, Scott frantically yelled to Gary, saying, quote, Gary, help, he's got a gun, end quote. Scott, in an attempt to defend himself, grabbed a wicker chair, backing away from the door. Jonathan fired two shots, striking Scott in the chest, killing him almost immediately. After the murder, Jonathan drove to a local gas station and called 911 to turn himself in. News of Scott's murder spread rapidly, capturing the attention of the nation and sparking intense debates about the responsibilities of reality television and the potential consequences of exposing personal secrets for entertainment purposes. Once Jonathan's trial began, it quickly became a highly publicized event, attracting media coverage and a lot of legal analysis. The defense centered their argument on temporary insanity, 
claiming that the intense emotional distress caused by the show's revelations pushed Jonathan to commit the act without any rational thought behind it. In contrast, the prosecution argued that Jonathan's actions displayed a level of premeditation. They presented evidence suggesting that Jonathan's decision to purchase the shotgun and the ammunition and then confront Scott was indicative of a very calculated plan to seek revenge, thus undermining the defense's claim of temporary insanity. As the trial unfolded, testimonies were heard and evidence was presented and the jury was faced with the difficult task of determining the truth behind Scott's murder. Testimony at trial revealed that Jonathan had bipolar disorder and depression. Additionally, it was revealed that Jonathan had multiple previous suicide attempts, had an abusive father, which I will elaborate on in a minute, and additionally, he suffered from Graves' disease. With all of this information in mind, the defense presented a theory that Jonathan had a diminished capacity at the time of the murder. Jonathan, based on these mental health challenges, was already struggling. Following the ambush during the Jenny Jones show, the defense argued that Jonathan was betrayed by not only his friend Donna, but his friend Scott as well. Furthermore, the defense implied that Scott stalked Jonathan. There's no evidence on that. I think they're just basing that on that one note, but there's no evidence of that. Based on all of this, the defense stated that Jonathan did not have a sufficient mental capacity because he was suffering from bipolar disorder, depressive disorder, and additionally, the consequences that he suffered from untreated Graves' disease. Quickly, this is an autoimmune disorder. It causes an overactive thyroid or hypothyroidism. So essentially, your body is creating more thyroid hormones than it needs. Leading up to trial, Jonathan was charged with first-degree murder and felony firearms charges. However, after deliberating for a few days, the jury returned a verdict of the lesser offense of second-degree murder, and Jonathan was sentenced to 25 to 50 years in prison in 1996. Jonathan appealed this conviction in 1998, and his conviction was ultimately overturned due to error in jury selection. According to appeal documents, I'm just going to read from them really quickly, quote, The prosecutor posits that because the jury found defendant guilty of the lesser offense of secondary murder, it necessarily accepted defendant's defense of diminished capacity and that defendant can ask for no more. We disagree. The jury was also instructed regarding the lesser offenses of voluntary manslaughter, death of a person by discharging a firearm that was intentionally aimed at the person, and negligent use of a firearm. And, of course, the jury could have found defendant not guilty of offense. Pursuant to the above cited authority, we hold that it is impossible for the court to find that the trial court's error was harmless. Consequently, we reluctantly conclude, I love that, reluctantly conclude, that under the circumstances presented here, reversal of defendant's conviction is required. Jonathan was retried in 1999 and ultimately received the same sentence. However, in 1999, while all of this was going on, Scott's family also filed a wrongful death suit against the Jenny Jones show due to their ambush TV tactics, ascertaining that their negligence ultimately led to Scott's untimely death. This trial was even more publicized than the first, and testimony from many involved came to light. I listened to all of the testimony, and it was hours and hours long, and the testimony from his father, Alan, was very telling. You had asked him to call you as soon as he learned of who the secret admirer was, correct? Yes, sir. And he had not done that, correct? That's correct. And by 10 o'clock at night, you were aware that he hadn't called you, obviously. Yes. And you knew that the show had been scheduled to be taped sometime that afternoon, correct? Yes, sir. You had been expecting a phone call from him sometime that afternoon, correct? Yes, sir. And you had not received it. That's right. And uh, it was now hours after the show had been taped, and you still hadn't received a phone call, correct? That's right. And uh, uh, when he finally did call you around 10 o'clock, you were angry because he hadn't called you. Yes. And in fact, you chewed him out. Yes. That's how you started the conversation, correct? Yes. And uh, you became more angry when you found out 
that his secret admirer was a man, correct? Yes. And you expressed your anger, did you not? Yes. You were violently angry, were you not? Yes. You were really honked off about this, weren't you, Mr. Schmitz? Yes, sir. And you told him that, didn't you? I didn't tell him that. I, I made a statement. I, I was very angry. I didn't, I didn't convey my anger to him, more of my consolation to him. Sir, just like you were able to tell us what your son's mental impressions were and his state of mind was and how he was reacting to this, you made it pretty clear to him in that phone conversation you were angry. You were not happy, correct? I was not happy with what had happened to him. I was not that I was not happy with him. Yeah, and in fact, you were so unhappy about it, you used an expression, sir. You said, gay what? Bastards. Sure that's all you said? I, it was something, it was an expletive of that, whatever. You sure it didn't begin with an F and end with an S? It could have been that. I just said that for the not being profane in front of the court. I and I said sir. that in the criminal trial, too. I understand that. And I don't want you to be profane. But, in fact, what you said began with an F and end with, ended with an S, didn't it? Yes, that's what Gay. I said. Yes. Right? Gay, I'm sorry? Began with an F and ended with an S. Oh, yes. Okay, yes. I'm sorry. Okay. I understand what the word is. Okay. I think we all understand what you said, sir. And you threw a chair, didn't you? Yes. So you had gone from the point of being wildly enthusiastic and thinking of grandchildren to learning that your son's secret admirer was a man and you didn't like it, did you? I, thinking of grandchildren, I, that was, I, I'm not saying that was part of the equation, thinking that Jonathan had a secret admirer to it being something different than what it was supposed to have been, I was angry about Sir, you've already explained your expectations before this show began. Yes, sir. My question to you now, sir, is, is it not the fact that you were angry on the night of March 6th that a man was interested sexually in your son and you told your son you didn't like it? No. Isn't that true? No. That's not true. You took a derogatory name. You called him Gay Blanks, didn't you? Right. If it was a motorcycle gang, I would have said the motorcycle bastards or whatever. If it was uh, if it were, anybody that would have hurt my son. Sure. It could have been a big, hairy, mean guy, that big, hairy, mean bastard. Sure, sir. Whatever. Part of your value system, part of that belief system that you raised your son with, you considered homosexuality to be a sin, did you not? I do now. I didn't consider it before. Sir? You considered homosexuality to be a sin. You've testified under oath that it was a sin, yes. correct? Yes. And you raised your son to believe it was a sin. It was contrary to the laws of God, contrary to the laws of the Bible. Isn't that true? No, never came up in our conversation. As a matter of fact, never came up because it was never discussed. It fact, was not part of our, it was not part of us. Fact is, sir, you were not happy that your son had been a for some reason, for whatever the reason, some man had found him attractive, and you made it clear to your son on the night of March 6th, you were very unhappy You're about You're mischaracterizing that. the question. I was angry that my son was duped into thinking that this was a woman when, in fact, it was a, was a homosexual fest. You spent five minutes on the phone with your son, correct, on the night of March 6th? Yes, sir. The first part of it was spent chewing him out because he hadn't called no. Her earlier. no. Additionally, there was a line of questioning directed at Alan that inquired as to why he stated to his son Jonathan that he needed to murder Scott in order to stop the harassment and stop people from thinking that he was gay. I wanted to include that audio, but when Alan went to answer the question, it ended up in quite literally a clusterfuck of an argument between the attorney that was asking the questions Alan and the judge, and there was really no concise answer. Long story short, he said that that was a written statement to the private investigators based on what happened after the murder. But to me, that's a heavy implication. The fact that that question is even asked, why he would state that Scott needed to be murdered, that implies something very legitimate that I think we need to consider when we're looking at this case. At the end of the suit that Scott Amador's family brought up, producers of the Jenny Jones show were ultimately found to be negligent, and the Amador family was awarded $25 million. However, three years after the civil verdict, Warner Brothers challenged the ruling in the Michigan Court of Appeals, and Warner Brothers won. Scott's family never received any financial compensation for their loss. 
I'm going to briefly read some excerpts from that decision. Logic compels the conclusion that defendants in this case had no duty to anticipate and prevent the act of murder committed by Schmitz three days after leaving defendants' studio and hundreds of miles away. Here, the only special relationship, if any, that ever existed between defendants and plaintiffs' decedent, or between defendants and Schmitz, was that of business inviter to invitee. However, any duty ends when the relationship ends, and in this instance, the inviter invitee relationship ended on March 6, 1995, three days before the murder, when Schmitz and Amador peacefully left the Chicago studio following the taping of the episode. Because the evidence, even when viewed from a perspective most favorable to plaintiffs, revealed no ongoing special relationship at the time of the murder. Defendants owed no duty to protect the plaintiff's decedent from Schmitz's violent attack on March 9, 1995. The present situation simply cannot, under any reasonable interpretation of the circumstances, be construed as involving an existing relationship that required defendants to respond to a risk of imminent and foreseeable harm to an identifiable invitee on the premises. Consequently, the trial court erred as a matter of law in denying defendants' motions for summary disposition, a directed verdict, and judgment notwithstanding the verdict on the basis of lack of duty, an essential element of any negligence action. Plaintiffs seek to characterize the case as one involving misfeasance, alleging that it was reasonably foreseeable that defendants' conduct, both in creating and taping an episode on the topic of same-sex crushes, and in actively creating a volatile situation, would cause Schmitz to murder Amador. A duty may be imposed in cases of alleged misfeasance where, notwithstanding the general rule that criminal conduct is unforeseeable as a matter of law, the third party's criminal conduct is a reasonably foreseeable consequence of the defendant's actions under the particular circumstances of the case. I'm going to just skip ahead. The case presents no exceptional circumstances warranting departure from that general rule because the evidence at trial disclosed, quote, no reason to accept the contrary, end quote. They go on to detail that Schmitz gave every appearance of being a normal, well-adjusted adult who consented to being surprised on the show by a secret admirer of unknown sex and identity. If you remember earlier in the episode, I stated that it really couldn't be proven in court whether the producer stated it was either male, female, or both. And that's something that was upheld in court. It really couldn't be established. It was a case of producer said versus what Jonathan said. However, I threw my two cents in, which I know is irrelevant. And this is simply based on the fact that when I watched the episode myself and Jenny Jones was like, well, it's Scott. Jonathan looked at his friends and said, oh, you lied to me. I couldn't think of any other reason as to why he would say that. Other than the fact that producers told him it was a woman that was his crush. Now, this is of the utmost importance when you're thinking of the suit that the Amador family brought against Warner Brothers Entertainment, right? Because if they are going to hold the producers culpable, they need to establish that the producers did lie or lie by omission in order to create that ambush television circumstance. If the producers said it could be a male, it could be a female, then that would kind of negate the whole gay panic defense that Jonathan tried to bring out at his trial. Unfortunately, that is something that could never be proven and the Amador family ended up losing their civil suit at the end of the day. While originally, the Jenny Jones show producers were found to be negligent and the Amador family was awarded $25 million, after the appeals process started in the Michigan Court of Appeals, Warner Brothers won and Scott's family never received any financial compensation for their loss. The appeals document concluded with, quote, In sum, we conclude that defendants owed no duty as a matter of law to protect plaintiff's decedent from the intentional criminal acts of a third party, Jonathan Schmitz, that occurred three days after the taping of the Jenny Jones show. While defendants' actions in creating and producing this episode of the show may be regarded by many as the epitome of bad taste and sensationalism, 
such actions are, under the circumstances, insufficient to impute the requisite relationship between the parties that would give rise to a legally cognizable duty. The trial court, therefore, erred in denying defendants' motions in this regard. Because we find no antecedent duty, we need not address the other issues raised by defendants on appeal. Accordingly, we reverse the judgment, vacate the order, and remand to the trial court with directions that it enter a judgment and order in favor of defendants. Judgment reversed, order vacated, and case remanded. We do not retain jurisdiction. According to the LGBTQ plus bar, today, the panic defense has been banned in the following states. California, Illinois, Rhode Island, Nevada, Connecticut, Maine, Hawaii, New York, New Jersey, Washington, Colorado, the District of Columbia, Virginia, Vermont, Oregon, Maryland, and New Mexico. Legislation against the LGBTQ plus panic defense has been introduced, but has not yet been passed in so many fucking states. This is ridiculous. Wisconsin, Texas, Nebraska, New Hampshire, Minnesota, Massachusetts, Pennsylvania, Michigan, North Carolina, Georgia, Arkansas, Iowa, and Florida. As for the Jenny Jones show, that remained on air until 2003, 12 years after it aired on national television. Jonathan Schmitz was released from prison in 2017 after serving 22 years in prison. Fred, Scott's brother, has said publicly that Jonathan was also a victim and he should not have been put in that situation on The Jenny Jones Show. The murder of Scott Amador left a lasting impact on society, raising important questions about the ethics of reality television and the potential dangers of exploiting personal secrets for entertainment purposes, and the duty of producers to prioritize the well-being of their guests over sensationalism. Reflecting on cases like this, I think we need to ask ourselves if ambush television is a way to exercise our rights regarding the First Amendment, or should there be a firm line drawn in the sand to indicate just how far freedom of speech and freedom of the press should go? Scott Amador's murder was not the first or last tragedy driven by television in the United States. In 1974, news anchor Christine Chubbuck committed suicide on air after a long battle with depression that was magnified due to the growing popularity of sensationalized violence over legitimate journalism. In 2000, while recording an episode of Jerry Springer, Ralph Panitz, who claimed on air that his ex Nancy was stalking him and his new wife, it ended up being revealed that he and his ex Nancy slept together before taping. Hours after the episode aired, Nancy was found dead after being brutally beaten in her home. Ralph and his new wife surrendered to police a week later. In 2006, Assistant United States District Attorney Bill Conrad of Dallas, Texas, shot himself in the head after being identified as a man who allegedly solicited a perverted justice volunteer who posed as a minor, but never actually traveled to meet the minor. In 2009, after appearing on Megan Wants a Millionaire, Ryan Jenkins married model Jasmine Fiore shortly after the show premiered. She was found dead on August 15, 2009, strangled and stuffed into a suitcase. Jenkins was charged with murder, ultimately committing suicide eight days later on August 23rd, prompting the series to be canceled. The murder of Scott Amador serves as a tragic reminder of the far-reaching consequences that can arise when boundaries are crossed, privacy is violated, and emotions are pushed to their absolute breaking point. Scott's memory and the events surrounding his murder continue to remind us of the fragility of life and the profound impact that our actions absolutely have every day on the lives of others. Even today, almost three decades later, Scott's murder serves as a cautionary tale. It's a reminder that the consequences of our actions and the power of our words can extend far beyond our intentions, be it good or bad. And now, here's CJ from Beyond the Rainbow. Far too many killers are allowed to use the gay trans panic defense in those states that still allow it. 
I have another case that I'm going to tell you about where it was also used. And the ironic thing about this case, the victim who was murdered in the case was from the state of Virginia. The state of Virginia in 2021 was the first southern state to adopt the gay trans panic defense. 19-year-old Issa Memin Utute was in his freshman year and a linebacker for the Virginia Tech football team in April of 2021. He started to talk to someone on Tinder, someone who presented as a woman and called herself Angie. A few episodes ago, I said trans folk live under a double-edged sword. They're damned if they tell people they're trans and they're damned if they don't. Well, Angie, who also went by Gigi Smith, was assigned male at birth. Their family and friends knew them as 40-year-old Jerry Paul Smith, and they believed Jerry was an openly gay man. Jerry's family were not aware that Jerry might have been a trans woman who went by Angie, or it's possible Jerry could have very well been a gender nonconformist. Jerry going by Angie, and that's what I'm going to refer to Jerry as, Angie because that's who they represented themselves as on Tinder, and Issa Memon met in person in April. The night they met, Angie performed oral sex on the football player. And you know what? Issa Memon wasn't the least bit angry as that happened. The following month, Issa Memon got to thinking, Two plus two is four. The sky is blue and it's not cloudy. Oh, and that woman Angie from Tinder? She may not have been assigned female at birth, or in his more simple mind, was that chick a dude? So Issa Memon made plans to meet up with Angie the night of May 31st, 2021. He wanted to see her again, and he took a visit to Angie's apartment. Angie's apartment was not real well lit. It was rather dark that night. Angie was prepared to orally service the football player again. But Issa Memon had other ideas as he groped Angie's crotch in the dark, and he put his phone light into Angie's private region, revealing a penis. It was at that moment Issa Memon got lost in blind rage, and he began to pummel Angie in her face with his fist and to stomp Angie's head with his shoes. Now remember, this cat was a linebacker. He's pretty big and strong. Every single bone in Angie's face had been broken. Several of her teeth had been knocked out. Issa Memon then left Angie on the floor of her apartment, bubbling and gurgling from her mouth as she lay dying in Blacksburg, Virginia. Investigators looked into the case and they searched Angie's phone, and in particular the Tinder app. From messages exchanged, they were able to tell Issa Memon was the last one she had met with. He became a top suspect and he was arrested for Angie's murder. Issa Memon was being charged with second-degree murder and was now facing a sentence of five to 40 years in prison. That meant Issa Memon's football career was pretty much over because Virginia Tech had to suspend him from the team. Even though just that year, in 2021, Virginia banned the gay trans panic defense in court, Issa Memon's attorney tried his luck with it and blamed the victim, Angie. The defense attorney said, the victim was a deceitful and dishonest man. No one deserves to die, but I don't mind saying, don't pretend you're something you're not. Don't target or lure anyone under that perception. That's just wrong. Who was the real victim here? This was a wicked sexual ruse. I don't understand how it was a wicked sexual ruse when there was only one man in the equation being gratified. But the defense went on to say Angie had a knife hidden between her mattress and frame. Issa Memon then testified he saw her reach for it and thought it was a gun. And this was something he failed to state to the police when he was questioned. But his defense attorney now was not only just using the gay trans panic defense in a state that supposedly had just banned it, but he was also using the self-defense ploy to fight Issa Memon's case. The trial lasted three days. The defense attorney apparently did a much better job than the prosecution because the jury came back with an acquittal of all charges for Issa Memon. That young man got away with a free blowjob and took the life of a human being without any punishment at all. So I ask, 
if a state is going to ban using the gay trans defense and then not stand by it, what the fuck good is it? Well, my question was answered in my research. The ban didn't go into effect until July 1st, 2021, a couple months after Issa Memon's trial. Every single state should ban the gay trans panic defense in their justice systems. Otherwise, it's a huge statement that it's okay to kill LGBTQ people and there'll be no consequences for it. The gay trans panic defense is a form of victim blaming, implying the victim had it coming. When in fact, if someone's orientation or gender identity provokes violence, it's a hate crime. Allowing the gay trans panic defense essentially is the justice system's way of saying, oh, but some crimes are okay and justified. How about we adopt an idiot panic defense? I killed that person because they were so stupid they scared me. No, really, they were babbling dumb things and I was in fear of the safety of my sanity. That makes about as much sense as the gay trans panic defense. Rest in power, Scott and Angie slash Jerry. Thank you again, Ashley, for doing this collaboration with me. I appreciate it. As Pride Month comes to an end, I want to leave you all with a quote by James Baldwin. Love takes off the masks we fear we cannot live without and know we cannot live within. And as you think about these cases that we've presented, I just want you all to take a step back and understand that we're all different. We all come from different walks of life. And that's nothing to be fearful of or judgmental of. In fact, that's what makes us all different. It's what makes us all beautiful. I ask you all to try to be mindful of how you treat other people. Try to be kind. Try to approach everybody with love, kindness, and respect. Let's be serious. Life is already fucked up as is. We don't need to make it any more difficult for anybody else. If you liked what you heard today, please like, review, subscribe. You can find me on all social medias at fthatpod, Instagram at fthat underscore pod. Don't forget to check out the website fthatpod.com. Love you, bye.